Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. The party of former Yugoslav strongman Slobodan Milosevic told the AFP it would, not, it would bring down the Serbian government if it fails to comply with a demand for his funeral to be held in his homeland. The sudden death of Slobodan Milosevic in UN custody on Saturday has raised intriguing questions, notably what sparked the former Yugoslav strongman's heart attack and where he will be buried. An expert who examined his blood alleged that Milosevic deliberately took a drug that neutralized his heart medicine as the UN war crime court prepared to release his body. More in this report. An autopsy performed Sunday pinpointed myocardial infraction as the immediate cause of Slobodan Milosevic's death, but an ICTY spokeswoman said it was too early to rule out poisoning as charged by his entourage and the ex-president himself in a letter revealed after his death. Milosevic's legal advisor, Zdenko Tomanovic, said Sunday that the former strongman had addressed a letter to the Russian foreign ministry, saying that he feared he was being poisoned after receiving a medical report indicating large amount of a drug for tuberculosis or leprosy in his blood. A Russian daily reported the ministry had not received such a letter. Milosevic's widow, Mirjana Markovic, known as Mira, is believed to have been living in Russia since fleeing Serbia in 2003. She has been charged by Belgrade with abuse of her office and there is an international arrest warrant issued in her name. Serbian President Boris Tadic on Sunday said he would not pardon Markovic, meaning she would be unable to return home for a funeral ceremony if it is held in Serbia. Milosevic's funeral poses a conundrum for Serbian authorities, with his family split over where he should be laid to rest, and his widow Markovic risking arrest if she comes home. Markovic dubbed the Lady Macbeth of the Balkans, told a Serbian newspaper she had still not decided where her husband would be buried. President Tajic ruled out a state funeral, saying he believes such an observance would be completely inappropriate, given Milosevic's role in the bloody Balkans conflicts. According to media reports from Serbia, the only other possible burial site appears to be Russia. But Russian newspapers today rejected the notion that the late Serb leader had privileged relations with Russia as a myth. It added that another myth was claims that he fought to preserve Yugoslavia and the unity of the Serb people. A Russian offer aimed at ending a standoff over Iran's nuclear ambition still stands despite its initial failure to win support from Tehran. The Russian ambassador to South Korea said Moscow still preferred diplomacy to resolve the issue, soon to be discussed by the UN Security Council, which has the power to impose sanctions. At stake is Iran's nuclear program, which Tehran says is a drive for peaceful energy, but is alleged by the United States to be a cover for weapons production. Amid fruitless efforts by Britain, France and Germany to frustrate the Iranian nuclear drive, Russia had proposed a compromise under which Iran would enrich uranium on Russian, not Iranian soil. But Iran's foreign ministry said Sunday that the Russian offer was off the agenda, indicating disapproval of the compromise proposal. Tehran later toned down its position by saying that the plan was still negotiable. British Foreign Minister Jack Straw argues in a speech to be delivered today that the UN Security Council must keep the door open for talks with Iran. While en route to Indonesia from Chile, US Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice said Iran's announcement was not a surprise. The Washington Post, meanwhile, reported today that the Bush administration intends to mount a campaign against Tehran's religious leaders in its efforts to build international pressure against Iran's nuclear program. Under Secretary of State Nicholas Burns told the Post that the department would add staff in Dubai as well as at other embassies in the vicinity of Iran, all assigned to watch Tehran.
Iran suspects American President George W. Bush is using the nuclear issue as a pretext to promote change in the Islamic Republic's government. This week, the UN Security Council is due to take up Iran's case after the International Atomic Energy Agency sent the council a report saying it could not verify that Iran's nuclear plans were purely peaceful. There has been no let-up in violence in Iraq, with dozens of Iraqis killed in the, in the past 24 hours. But Iraq's radical Shai cleric Mohdud al-Sadr said he would not order his militia to strike Sunni al-Qaeda militants after Sunday's bloody bombing of his Baghdad stronghold because that would mean civil war. Sadr blasted U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Trumpsfeld for keeping U.S. troops in Iraq while saying they would not be used in case of civil war. In the latest violence, four policemen and six civilians were wounded when a roadside bomb hit a police patrol in central Baghdad this morning. Police also said one person was killed and six wounded when a roadside bomb went off in Taji, about 20 kilometers north of Baghdad. The bodies of four people were found in the eastern Sadr city district of the capital. They had been shot and there were signs of torture. One Iraqi was killed and 12 wounded when two car bombs exploded within 15 minutes of each other in the northern city of Kirkuk. On the foreign toll, a U.S. Marine had died in fighting in western Iraq. On Sunday, six car bombs ripped through the East Baghdad stronghold of a major Shiite militia force and killed 46 people and wounded 204. It raised fears of reprisal could again pitch Iraq towards civil war. The apparently coordinated attacks on markets in Sadr city occurred as political leaders, shepherded by the U.S. ambassador to Iraq, met once more without obvious results to discuss forming a national unity government that might avert a bloodbath. Three months after elections in which the once dominant Sunni minority took full part, hopes that this would help end violence and bring the country together have been dented. Parliament has yet to meet, but President Jalal Talabani said it would now do so on Thursday, three days earlier than planned. Talks on a government were halted by the violence after the Samara bombing, which killed hundreds in just a few days. U.S. Ambassador Zalmay Khadilzad playing a key role in negotiations that Washington hopes can curb violence and let it start withdrawing troops was upbeat. He called it positive that Parliament would now meet this week and said leaders would begin continuous talks on Tuesday with a view to settling on a coalition lineup soon. This evening, the Islamic resistance movement Hamas is preparing to submit a new draft for its government's agenda to the Fatah movement, which has rejected joining the new government unless it honors the independence documents relating to the announcements of the Palestinian state in 1988, which also names Fatah the main organization in the Palestinian Authority. Meanwhile, the Israeli occupation forces arrested five Palestinians under the pretext that they were trying to enter Israel. They claim that the Palestinians possessed hand grenades, detainees will be questioned by security forces. Differences over the government's programs proposed by Hamas and how close it is to the political line of the Palestinian Liberation Organization have caused confusion in the Palestinian political scene. Discussions on the Hamas program dominated the agenda of the parliamentary committees, which have been meeting in the past few days, to convince the Fatah movement to participate in a unity government headed by Ismail Haniya. Haniya, who was present during these discussions, renewed the call for unity. <laughs> The atmosphere was comfortable and honest. Our brothers will complete their meetings and discussions and marathon talks today and this evening. God willing, we hope that the ultimate outcome will be exactly what the Palestinian people want. The head of the Fatah party did not participate in the discussions, but was in Ramallah meeting with foreign diplomats, presenting them with the goals of the movement and its opinion about the government, as well as its determination in sticking to President Abbas's agenda. He denied that there were foreign pressures being placed on Fatah so as not to participate in the government. 
There is absolutely no pressure being placed on us. On the contrary, I will say clearly that we are actually afraid of the American and Israeli position because we have clear proof that there are open channels of indirect communication between Hamas, Israel, and the United States. I don't want to go into any more details. Some of the political forces are proposing a political exit strategy by having the Palestinian government take up the Saudi initiative. This would throw the ball in Israel's court, where there is a heated election campaign that is being played out by competing factions intent on taking more Palestinian land, joining the settlements to Israel and completing the apartheid wall. All major Israeli parties agree that the wall should become the permanent border with marginal differences. The major difference is over the unilateral disengagement policy Confronted with extremism, which distinguishes the Israeli election campaigns, the Palestinians must develop a realistic strategy aimed at gaining international support. Families of the missing prisoners of war in Israeli jails have staged a sit-in near the United Nations headquarters in Beirut. They have confirmed that those brave POWs deserve freedom. They also extended their gratitude to the Lebanese resistance, which played an important role in trying to win the freedom of the POWs. They criticized Wali Jumbalat's position on the POWs after he called for their abandonment. His comments undermine these heroes and their sacrifices, and is honor the prisoners' relatives. Protesters carried banners condemning Israel and accusing it of human rights violations. Israel uses torture as a method of punishment against detainees in its jails. We ask Walid Junblat if his political position will be the same if his son, Taymur or Atlan were among the prisoners. We tell Walid Junblat that we are not a nation that abandons its heroes in captivity. We are a nation that will do everything in its power to free its prisoners of war and detainees. In the meantime, Israeli warplanes continue to violate Lebanon's airspace by carrying out raids in the areas of Saida and neighboring refugee camps. According to the Lebanese National News Agency, enemy warplanes have launched a number of airstrikes in the era of Jezin, the Klimit Tufah, and the Shaba farms. Israeli enemy warplanes also hovered over the areas of Al-Bataniya and Qata al awsat south of Lebanon, and carried out a number of mock Rates. Meanwhile, units from the International Emergency Forces were deployed along the Lebanese-Palestinian border. The Israeli Military Central Command has declared a state of emergency in the areas adjacent to the Lebanese border. Melish Stroger, the spokesman of the International Forces in southern Lebanon, Yoni Tal, has warned that the situation along the border is escalating and needs to be contained. He also criticized Israel for continuing to violate Lebanon's airspace and its sovereignty. According to Stroger, the Yoni Tal has cited a number of violations by the Israeli Air Force. Israeli warplanes have violated Lebanon's airspace many times in recent days. Welcome to the second part of this special interview with His Honorable Sheikh Muqtada Sadr. God keeps his legacy forever. Politically speaking, and in regards to a Sadr faction in the Iraqi parliament, what would you like to see done different by the parliament in order to serve the Iraqi people better? Good question. In the meantime, and under Iraqi status quo, Two important issues need to be addressed. One aspect has to do with social services, including water, gas, electricity, and others. The Iraqi people are in dire need for these public and social services, which are very limited. Most of these services are not on the priority list of Iraqi officials who are preoccupied with other political issues. The second issue, which is important, is that we must set a timetable agenda for the occupation forces to withdraw from Iraq. This will serve the interests of the Iraqi people, but it will mark a victory for Iraqis and Muslims all over the world. However, it is not a victory over terrorism. Hence, the Iraqi people 
people will be united and will be able to combat the occupier and counter its attacks. Mr. Honorable Sheikh, there has been a change in your political position. The Asadr group has completely opposed and was reluctant to enter the political spectrum. And now, what made you change your position and decide to join the political movement? I know you mentioned earlier it was for the sake of the Iraqi people. However, there are a number of outstanding political obstacles, such as federation, and rooting out Ba'athists that may face the Assadr faction. How will you deal with such a problem? As far as a federation is concerned, I believe it is a good ideology. However, it came at a bad time and will cause a number of problems. It will divide Iraq and weaken the Iraqi people. It will increase animosity and regional disputes among different sects of the Iraqi people. Moreover, it will open a door to foreign players to intervene in Iraqi internal affairs. These are some of the negative side effects of the Federation, and by and large, are not the only ones. How about rooting out Ba'athists? We must increase our effort to root out Ba'athists. Currently, this campaign has not been put into action. I call on the current and the upcoming Iraqi government to put it into practice. Ba'athists, even if they are in the government, continue to spread corruption and hatred in Iraq. Tyrant leaders of the Ba'ath party had a chance to run the country. We should not give them yet another opportunity to stir corruption in Iraq and abuse and oppress the Iraqi people. Mr. Honorable Sheikh, some people draw the line between two distinguished the groups within the Ba'ath party. They contend that there are two different Ba'athists. Some are law-abiding citizens and others are Saddamists. The Saddamists are the ones who are corrupt and abusive. What is your opinion in that? Generally speaking, we could distinguish between the two sides. During the former regime of Saddam, joining the Ba'ath Party was mandatory. Some members were compelled to join the Ba'ath Party, and therefore they may not have been accessories to any crimes committed by dictators of the former regime. However, those Ba'athist leaders, senior and low-ranking officials who committed crimes against Iraqis must be brought on charges and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Let's assume that the occupation forces withdrew from Iraq and the Assad party was offered a government position based on its parliamentary representation and its popularity among the Iraqi people. Will you accept such nomination and what do you wish for? Do you mean a government position? Yes, a government position. No, I will not accept. My position is not political. I am a civil servant. I have a civil and non-political duty to serve the Iraqi people. And by doing this, I will get closer to God and to the Iraqi people. However, governmental positions widen the gap between the Iraqi people and the elected officials. And this is what I want to accomplish. And this is what God wants done. The British Broadcasting Corporation revealed that London had covertly provided the Israeli occupation with plutonium in 1966. This move had a strong role in advancing Israel's research for a nuclear bomb. The BBC added that the British intelligence agency had notified the British government that Israel, which at that time denied the IAEA access to its reactors, was actually making nuclear bombs. للمرة الثانية خلال عام يتم الكشف عن تورط بريطاني في تطوير الترسانة النووية الإسرائيلية وتأكيد علم الإدارة البريطانية منذ البداية بسعي إسرائيل إلى تطوير سلاح For the second time in a year, news reports revealed that the British had a role in developing the Israeli nuclear arsenal. The British government had known all along that Israel was seeking to acquire nuclear weapons since it built the Dimona nuclear reactor. The British Broadcasting Corporation revealed that London had provided Israel 
with plutonium in 1966. Plutonium is a very important material used in experiments aimed at advancing nuclear research. The British Foreign Ministry at the time expressed reservations about providing Israel with plutonium for fear that it might be used for military purposes. Despite the British Foreign Ministry opposition, the British envoy to the IAEA, Michael Michaels, helped in sealing a deal. Michaels was Jewish and was known for his strong ties with the Israeli occupation on one side and the British intelligence on the other. In addition to plutonium, Israel imported enough material to manufacture a bomb 10 times as strong as the bomb that Washington used against Hiroshima in 1945. This information has focused the world's attention on the Israeli nuclear program and especially on the role of large countries such as US, Britain, France, and even Germany in contributing to the development of Israel's nuclear program. Not to mention a scandal that involved intelligence cooperation between France and Israel would start in what was known as the French settlement in North Africa. American nuclear technology was leaked to Paris in exchange for French help in the construction of the Dimona nuclear reactor. First, the American president John F. Kennedy was opposed to the Israeli nuclear program. But when his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, who was known for his loyalty to Israel, took the presidential office, he changed the American policy 180 degrees. Johnson had even provided Israel with planes capable of carrying nuclear bombs. In addition, in a few years ago, Israel had made a deal to import German ships capable of transporting nuclear arsenals. Despite the facts that were revealed by Mordecai Venunu in 1985, when he disclosed that the Dimona reactor was not peaceful and that Israel had manufactured more than 300 nuclear warheads, the UN Security Council and the IAEA had failed to do anything. <laughs> Denmark held a conference on religious and cultural dialogue. Several Muslim and Christian religious leaders participated in the event. In the aftermath of a wave of anger which swept the Islamic world after a Danish newspaper published cartoons defaming the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Danish government sponsored and funded this conference. In an attempt to contain the anger that was created by the insulting cartoons of the Prophet, peace be upon him, which was published by Danish and some European newspapers, a conference was organized in the Danish capital of Copenhagen to discuss faith and culture and was attended by Christian and Muslim religious leaders. It aimed at establishing a dialogue based on mutual respect and to clarify the misunderstandings that were created by these caricatures. The conference, which was organized and sponsored by the Danish government confirmed the need for dialogue and understanding between people. It was held on the condition that the Danish government would give an official apology on the insulting cartoons of the Prophet, peace be upon him. The participants also requested from the Danish government to have a direct dialogue with the Danish Muslims and to pass an international law to protect religions, otherwise they would continue the Muslim boycott. I stated very clearly that we wanted a direct dialogue with Danish Muslims and the world. We want an official apology and we want to change the laws of Denmark and the European Union, just as we want freedom of speech for all. The Islamic religious leader Amr Khalid held the West accountable for their doubled standard policies in which they justify hurting the feelings of more than one billion Muslims under the pretext of democracy and free speech. He indicated that the only ones who benefit from these cartoons are extremist groups, whether they are Muslim or Christian. Despite the importance of the Copenhagen conference, it did not achieve the requests of the Muslim participants, which demanded an official apology from the Danish government. Meanwhile, criticism were also made against the Muslim community in Denmark who weren't even asked to participate in the conference, which was seen as an indication that the Danish government was ill-intentioned in organizing it.
The representation of Jordanian women in the political arena has become a reality, but it remains below expectations. This calls for intensifying efforts and looking for effective ways to create change. Although over half the population are women, there is discrimination against Jordanian women in the distribution of political offices. The high population of women does not translate proportionately in politics when it comes to holding office or entering decision-making positions. There are many reasons for this. In general, in Jordan, we have a male-dominated society. Men have always dominated women based on tribal or agricultural society's values. The reason for the lack of participation is because the political process requires major financing. So there's competition for political financing. Women do not have this political backing. So they don't have any money that they can spend on campaigns. Another reason is that society has generally prohibited women from participation and has tried to shelter them. There are many mechanisms that women can utilize to become more effective participants in politics. However, to achieve a qualitative leap, there must be an effective method that can expedite the process. This is the only way to achieve tangible results that can resonate through the society. Only when the society changes can women have an effective role in politics. In order to allow women to become more politically active, we recently placed a quota. This is the most prominent action that has been taken to encourage more female political participation. However, we hope that greater participation can happen through regular voting. As we noticed from previous elections, most women received most of their votes from men and not from women. Therefore, we encourage women to support other women and vote for them. The parliament has posed new laws to enforce the quota system, just like previous parliaments have done for the past decade. Although the positions that have been occupied by women differ from one parliament to the next, a certain number of positions had always been saved for them. In addition, there are discussions in parliament to allocate certain number of municipal positions to women, which may then pave the way for women to be able to enter into political parties. I call on women to participate in political parties in an intensive manner. If the quota system is going to help women, then let it be, so long as women can share in senior and sensitive positions. Women must be represented in the election slates, where candidates win based on percentages, and they should be appointed to leading positions. There should be more political participation by women. Women may comprise half of our society, but they also rear the other half. This means that they possess the most effective and ideal methods to change society. When we talk about women's role in political life, we should always keep in mind the essential role women play in raising families, which are the basic building blocks of our nation. Some 300 Beitar Jerusalem fans are en route to Doha Stadium in Sakhnin at this hour to watch their team in action against the predominantly Arab Bnei Sakhnin team. 700 police officers will secure the game and tensions are running high since the last encounter between the two clubs at Doha, which ended in a riot and resulted in a four-game crowd ban for the home team. Both clubs have issued calls for fans to remain calm, fearing that another incident can result in both clubs playing in front of empty stadiums in the future. There could also be some provocations. Ultra-right-wing Knesset can candidate Baruch Marzel and members of the National Jewish Front Party have announced that they plan to attend the game. The views expressed on Mosaic are not those of Link TV or its sponsors, but of the broadcasters themselves.
Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedall Foundation and Henry and Virgilia Dakin.